creators of the money supply. A computer which can just make money out of thin air. We have the ability to create money. Banks create money out of thin air. The idea that these reserves are then multiplied up into additional loans. This is the essence of the so-called money multiplier theory. How is this account misleading? This model is false. Not only have they ignored a century's worth of critics like myself, they've also ignored authorities like the Bank of England and the Bundesbank saying the rebels are right and the mainstream thinkers are wrong. And this is why you can't trust mainstream economists on the money supply. Well, if you're a non-economist, you probably think that economists are experts on money because, after all, economics is at least in part about money and the money supply. So they must know how the money system operates and how banks create money and so on and so forth. What economists teach is a model called the money multiplier. And I want to just quickly show how that's taught by a fairly popular YouTuber, Jacob Clifford. Let's have a listen to how he explains the money multiplier. Now, you're also going to see the idea of the multiplier we learn about fractional reserve banking and how banks create money. Now, instead of money being spent and saved, it's money being deposited and loaned out. When you deposit money in the bank, it must hold a portion in required reserves and then loans the rest out. The person who took out the loan spends that money and eventually that money gets its way back into another bank. That bank then holds a portion in reserves and loans the rest out. This keeps happening over and over and over again. So that's the standard model of how money is created, taught by all textbooks. And in 2014, the Bank of England wrote this paper. So they say here, banks do not multiply out bank central bank money to create new loans and deposits. And then in 2017, of all things, the Bundesbank came out and said the same thing. A bank's ability to grant loans and create money has nothing to do with whether it has excess reserves or deposits at its disposal. That's fairly strong criticism from fairly mainstream organizations. So you might expect that economists revise what they taught in response, and you'd be wrong because they continue teaching exactly the same model. Not only have they ignored a century's worth of critics like myself saying this model is false, they've also ignored authorities like the Bank of England and the Bundesbank coming out and saying the rebels are right and the mainstream thinkers are wrong. Fractional reserve banking also breaks the basic rule of double entry bookkeeping, which states that all debits and credits recorded in the balance sheet not must equal zero, but must sum to zero on each row. Now, it caused almost immediate response by Bob Murphy, he doesn't see a problem. He thinks I've made a huge mistake by making this comment. George Selgan made a similar comment, says, if they, meaning banks, can use reserves to buy securities, they can use them to finance loans. Well, let's just take a look at that in my Ravel software. Start with a very simple model of the banking sector, where there's just reserves, bonds owned by the banks, and loans on the asset side for the banking system, deposits as a liability, and the remainder of the amount of money in the system is the bank's short-term equity. If we show buying government bonds, so buy treasuries, then what happens is uh, the amount of money in the reserve accounts of the banks goes down. So we have minus buy bonds here, transferring that money from the reserve accounts that banks have at the central bank to the treasury. The treasury then credits the banks with bonds of equivalent value. So we have minus buy bonds here, plus buy bonds here. And according to Ravel, this is correct because the fundamental rule of accounting is that assets minus liabilities equals equity. And therefore, assets minus liabilities minus equity must equal zero. That row works. So that's showing that, yes, the operation of banks buying bonds using what's in their reserves is quite feasible in accounting. It's what banks actually do. Now, let's now take a look at the operation of lending from reserves, which, according to George, is very much the same as this operation of buying treasuries. So we're going to have lend from reserves, and that means there's going to be a minus here, like there was a minus for the, for the bond buying, so minus reserves here. And, of course, if you're going to credit uh, the deposit account, you've got to have a plus over here, put it in and Ravel tells you, I'm sorry, you've made an accounting error. That row should sum to zero. Instead, it sums to minus two times the lend reserves flow. So you've made an accounting error. But not only is it an accounting error, any bank that did this would very rapidly go bankrupt because they're letting their assets fall and their liabilities rise. That is a recipe for bankruptcy. So this is not what actually happens. So this simply can't be true. So how can we make it correct? You need two entries for double entry bookkeeping and you need them to sum to zero on each row. So what about if I put it here, that reserves go down and loans go up? 
Now that works, that obeys the rule of accounting. And by the way, if you want to use my proprietary software Ravel for economic analysis too, you get it as a free bonus inside my seven week Rebel Economist Challenge, like over 600 people have already done. To learn more, apply at stevekeen.com. I hope you can see a slight technical problem here. How does the borrower get the money? So we've got to now go across and take a look at the bank customers table. If we have lend from reserves, increasing the liabilities, we know we can't put it in the deposit account. That turned up as an error on the bank's table. It would cause a cascade of errors through the system if I tried that again. What about if we say the loan is in cash? Now it works. The line balances. We're in the 21st century. What banks do to create money these days or to create loans is they credit the loan account. They say you owe us more money and we've also put that money into your deposit account. So let's type that in. If I want to show the real world where banks simply increase the amount you owe them by typing an amount into the loans column. This is standard normal bank lending. So they, they type uh, lend dollars per year into the amount of money you owe them and they type lend dollars per year into the amount in your deposit accounts. It's simple. It's what banks actually do. You only need one table to see it, whereas you need two to see the mythical model of loanable funds. So the question is, why do economists teach this stuff? Why do they teach that banks lend from reserves, which is more complicated than the actual way that banks lend and only works if all loans are in cash to begin with? Why do they teach it? And the answer is, first of all, they have not done the accounting. And you can see that with another prominent economist. Because of fractional reserve banking, the banking system has a big effect on the supply of money. Your bank keeps 10% of your $1,000 deposit or $100 as reserve. And suppose it lends out 90% or $900, say to Tyler, who's interested in starting a business. That $900 loan is credited to Tyler's checking account. No, it's not. This is the accounting error that I've just highlighted using my Ravel tables. If you try to do that, you get an accounting error. They are still effectively treating money as being like gold, where it's a commodity. They're not looking at it in terms of being created by banking systems using double entry bookkeeping, which is the modern world. So they have a wrong model. It doesn't work in accounting terms. It only works in the absurd situation that you have to assume that all loans are in cash, which of course they are not these days. Why do they stick with a false model? Everything that they blame on in the economy going wrong, they blame on the government. So they blame the government for creating too large a deficit. They will blame the government when there's a problem with the money system by saying that it was the government's decisions about the fractional reserve amount and the creation of initial money as well by the government. They made a mistake. And that is, in fact, why Ben Bernanke said that the Great Depression was caused by the Federal Reserve. Mainstream economists are not conscious that most of the time at the extent to which ideology dominates how they think about the economy rather than logic. But you can see it here in the speech that Ben Bernanke made where his explanation for the Great Depression was the same explanation explanation that Friedman came up with, which was the Federal Reserve was responsible for it because they didn't make the money multiplier large enough and they didn't enable the money supply to increase when gold came into the American economy. He's saying at the end of, a, end of his speech at Milton Friedman's birthday back in 2002, he says, let me end my talk by abusing my status as an official representative of the Federal Reserve. I'd like to say to Milton Friedman, Nana Schwartz, regarding the Great Depression, you're right, we did it, we're very sorry, but thanks to you, we won't do it again. Five years later, we walk into the global financial crisis. Why? Because economists were looking at what they thought the government was doing right or wrong and ignoring the private sector completely. It's the private sector that caused the bubble and crash of 2007. It was also the private sector that caused the boom and crash of the Roaring Twenties and the Great Depression. Mainstream economists, by default, come back and blame the government for everything. They therefore don't see what the private sector is doing. And this is, a, to a large degree, why they don't take into account the real world situation that banks create money simply by marking up their assets and their liabilities side and creating debt for the borrower as well as creating money at the same time. And this is why you can't trust mainstream economists on the money supply. You have to learn how the money supply actually operates and that's something I teach in my online course. Like many other truth seekers, I want to learn 50 years of real economics from me in only seven weeks. You'll love my new seven week Rebel Economist Challenge as well. To apply, go to stevekane.com. If you qualify, you can attend my lectures, ask me questions personally every week, and make friends with a great group of like minded people. So, again, like many others, go to stevekane.com to apply as well for the seven week Rebel Economist Challenge. Good luck.